Every Terraform tutorial is too complicated. Terraform is one of the most important technology in the world of DevOps, cloud and modern software development. If you don't understand Terraform, you will be left behind. In this tutorial, I'm going to explain Terraform in the simplest possible way, without all those technical definitions and unnecessary stuff, because at the end of the day, it all comes down to block of code made of type, type and your custom name, which can be anything. And yeah, there are also some parameters, but I will explain that in a moment. But before we start, please hit the subscribe button, it's a huge support for me and the channel, and in guarantee that you will stay up to date with new tutorials about programming and DevOps. Alright, but seriously, why do we even need Terraform? Imagine you're building infrastructure for a million dollar app. Sure, you could click everything manually in the console, but what happens when the app needs more resources, or when you need to deploy it in another region? Even more clicking, right? And worse, maybe you forgot one step along the way, and suddenly your app just stopped working. That's where Terraform steps in with infrastructure as code. By writing your infrastructure as code, you can push it to Git and track every single change. Something broke in test environment last week? Let's just open the Git history and see that Intel misnamed as free bucket. You roll back the change, and boom, everything is working again. You can even hook Terraform and Git into a CICD pipeline. For example, using GitLab CICD and your infrastructure can beat itself automatically. Should I make a video on that? Drop free comments below and I will do this project for you. In short, Terraform allows you to manage your entire infrastructure, servers, databases, even Kubernetes pods, all through simple configuration file. You can commit them to Git, track every change and recreate the whole environment in minutes. If something breaks, you just roll back to working version. What used to take hours of clicking now takes one comment. When we talk about Terraform, there are three key concepts you need to remember. Providers, resources and state. Terraform itself doesn't know how to create a server or a database. For that, it needs a provider. A provider is like a plugin that knows how to communicate with a specific platform like AWS, Azure or Google Cloud. You tell Terraform use the AWS provider and it instantly knows that it needs to talk to Amazon API. A resource is simply a piece of infrastructure you want to create, a virtual machine, a VPC network, or even a full Kubernetes cluster. All of these are resources, and in your configuration file you just describe their desired state and parameters. State is probably the most important piece of Terraform. Whenever you create infrastructure, Terraform saves information about what it built in a specific file, terraform.tfstate. Thanks to that, Terraform knows exactly what it manages. So, next time you run the code, for example, to add another server, Terraform compares three things, the desired state, your code, the current state, the TF file, and the real world state, what actually exists in your cloud account. That's how Terraform knows whether to create, update, or do nothing. For example, if your last commit didn't change anything. But here's the catch, if you lose that state file, Terraform will think that it doesn't own any resources and will try to re recreate everything from scratch, which means double the cost and massive cleanup. That's why in real project, the state file is usually stored remotely, like on S3 with versioning enabled. So if something goes wrong, you can easily restore it. Alright, let's get started and install Terraform in WSL console. Installation is super simple. You just grab the key from HashiCorp website add the repo to your system and install Terraform, either like I'm showing here or by following the official docs. Now that you've got Terraform installed, let's create our first resource, the good old S3 bucket. Let's create a new directory called Terraform demo and inside it make a file called main.tf. The first thing we need to tell Terraform is which provider we want to use. That will inform Terraform where all our resources will be created. So let's write provider AWS and region EU central minus one. In large projects, we'll usually put things like this in separate files. Same for variables or modules. But I will show you how to do this in another video. So make sure to subscribe to not miss out. Now, when it comes to creating resources, Terraform follows a simple convention. Type, type and name. The first type tells Terraform what kind of block this is, like resource, variable, output or module. The second type defines what kind of resource it is. For example, AWS S3 bucket for S3 bucket, AWS instance for EC2 server 
or AWS Security Group for a security group. I highly recommend checking the official documentation for resource names or ask ChatGPT to generate a template. Finally, we have resource names. This can be anything you want, but try to make it meaningful. Something like example bucket and not a123, because later we'll reference that name in other parts of our code. Inside that resource block, we might need to define a few parameters, and those depends on type of resource. So there is no single rule that works everywhere. You need to check the documentation for what's required and what is optional. In the case of S3, everything is optional. You will see optional in the brackets next to each field. So you could literally leave it empty. But let's add one field, the bucket name, just to show how it works. It's super simple. Variable name equals value. The value depends on field and can be string, number, boolean, or even complex data structures like list, maps, or net set configuration block. But let's stick with basics for now. Note that the bucket name must be unique, just like when you create it manually in AWS console. Before Terraform can actually do anything on your AWS account, you need to provide it credentials. There are a few ways to do this, but the simplest and safest way is to create a technical user in your AWS generate access token and then set it up in your default AWS CLI profile. Now let's install the AWS CLI and set credentials. Before we can create a new resource, Terraform needs to be initialized, so we run Terraform init. This downloads all the required providers and modules and set up the backend, basically the TF state file. Next, we create deployment plan, which shows exactly what Terraform will do before it does anything. Terraform plan, and I recommend saving that plan to a file using the minus out flag. That way, you can be sure that the plan you reviewed is exactly the same one you're about to apply. If everything looks good, you deploy it using Terraform Apply. Or if you save the plan, Terraform Apply TF plan. At this point, you will notice a new file in your directory, terraform.tf state. That's the state file, the one that tracks everything Terraform created. If you delete it, Terraform loses its memory of your infrastructure. Let's test that quickly. Terraform won't create a new resource. It knows one already exists. But if you remove the state file, it forgets everything and tries to recreate it all again. This is why most teams store the state file remotely, for example in an S3 bucket, so multiple people can work on the same infrastructure safely. To do that, you just need to create a new bucket. and add this block to your Terraform file. If you're working in a team, I highly recommend also setting up a DynamoDB table for locking to prevent two people from applying changes at the same time, especially since some Terraform plans can take an hour or more to run. Good infrastructure as code should never hard code values. It's like in programming, you should use variables to make your code flexible and reusable. So in our example, let's add a variable for the S3 bucket name. As far as I remember, you need to define at least the type or the default value, or you can have both, but the description is optional, but it's good practice to include it. Now we can use that variable by typing var.bucketName. 
Bucket name is the name of our variable, not the value, that is kubontech minus s3. If you want Terraform to print some information after deployment, for example the bucket IRN, you can use the output block. Let's update our full code and run it again. Now run Terraform in it, Terraform plan and Terraform apply. You will notice Terraform destroyed the old bucket and create a new one, because we changed its name. When you're done testing and want to clean up your infrastructure, all you need to do is run Terraform Destroy, then confirm with yes, and after a moment your S3 bucket is gone. The only one that remains is the bucket we created manually to store our TF state file, because Terraform doesn't manage that one. That's the real power of Terraform, you have the complete control over the entire lifecycle of your infrastructure. Now let's talk about something a bit more advanced, modules. Imagine you need to create 20 different environments, dev, test and prod, across three different regions. Writing the same code 60 times is not a great idea. A module is basically a reusable set of resources, like a package that contains everything your app needs, a server, a database, a network and so on. You can think of it like a class in object-oriented programming. Instead of copying and pasting the same code in every project, you build the module once and then reuse it everywhere you need. Here's an example where I got a little bit too far. So I create a few network resources and an EC2 instance. Now we can use this module simply by pointing to its source and pasting a few variables. Now, if you want to create another environment, like dev, you simply copy the module and change the variable values, then run terraform init, terraform plan and terraform apply, and as you can see, modules save us a lot of time, so we don't repeat the code and doesn't create terraform files with thousand lines of code. If you want to make this code even cleaner, you would like to separate variables and outputs into dedicated files, and now we've got perfectly organized code. So, that's it. Sure, we went a little bit deeper with modules, but hey, it wasn't that hard to follow, right? If you got any questions, drop them in comments. I will read all of them. And if you enjoyed this tutorial, hit the subscribe button. It really means a lot to me and ensures we don't miss future videos on DevOps, cloud or programming. Oh, and if you want to see how Docker or Kubernetes works, you definitely need to check this video.